and welcome to the Penguin Prof channel. In today's video, I'm going to talk about the autonomic nervous system. Students look at this. Holy sh**. This looks awful. We are going to do this Penguin Prof style. You want to stay tuned because we are going to cover a tremendous amount of stuff in a succinct and, dare I say, fun way. If you find these videos helpful, take a second, click those buttons. It makes a big difference. Information I am assuming today, some basics about neuron function, why ions want to move in the direction they do, and the magical world of signal transduction. If these are not familiar to you, go ahead, check those out first. So here's the overall view. We've got the periphery. We've got the peripheral nervous system, which brings information from the periphery into the brain and the spinal cord. This happens via a pathway we refer to as the afferent or sensory pathway. Within the brain and spinal cord, we have interneurons that lie entirely within the CNS. And then coming out from the CNS back to the periphery, we have what we call the motor or efferent pathway. That's actually what we are going to be looking at today. So there are two different categories of efferent pathways. We have the somatic motor neurons, and those innervate skeletal muscle, the muscle that you voluntarily move. The rest of your motor pathways are autonomic motor, and those innervate visceral effectors. And these are the ones that give students a really hard time, and those are the ones we're going to be focusing on. So the players in this story, the parts, if you will, we've got dendrites and cell bodies, and then emanating from those, we have axons. At the end of the axon, we have the axon terminal. This should be a review for everyone. The axon terminal releases molecules. We refer to these as neurons. Neurocrines. Most commonly, they are neurotransmitters, but neurocrine is a more general term and will also include things like neurohormones, which are released into the blood. These molecules will be received by receptors on target tissues, and the transmission of a signal across a space like this, whether it's a synapse or through the blood, we refer to that as signal transduction. And if you recall my video on signal transduction, what determines the meaning of a message is the ligand and the receptor that the ligand binds to. And this really is the key to understanding the autonomic nervous system. So we are going to be looking at the ligands, including acetylcholine. Now, when you see a neuron that produces acetylcholine, or you're looking at a receptor that acetylcholine binds to, we use the term cholinergic for that. So you'll see a cholinergic neuron, right? That just means the neuron releases acetylcholine. We also have the ligands epinephrine and norepinephrine, and those used to be called adrenaline and noradrenaline, and that's where we get this term adrenergic. Let's start with acetylcholine. So here's the actual structure, what it looks like, and we're going to look at the receptors that acetylcholine can bind to. The first are the nicotinic receptors. There are actually two subtypes. The only real difference is where they are in the body. But when acetylcholine binds to this nicotinic receptor, the response is always excitatory. So here's what happens. You see acetylcholine binding to this receptor, which is itself an ion channel. It allows sodium and potassium to move in the directions that they want to go. Now, sodium is going to flood in, potassium is going to sort of trickle out, and the effect is going to be excitation. If you don't know why that is, that's the video that you want to look at. Now, acetylcholine can bind to another group of receptors. These are called muscarinic receptors, and there are actually five subtypes of these. Some of them are excitatory, and some of them are inhibitory. So it depends on where you are in the body and which muscarinic receptor you're looking at. So for example, some of the inhibitory muscarinic receptors, you'll notice this is a G protein coupled receptor, and the effect is that potassium channels will be opened. This causes a hyperpolarization or an inhibition. And this is the kind of receptor that we see in myocardial cells. So this will cause a reduction of heart rate. On the other hand, in other tissues, acetylcholine will bind to other muscarinic receptors, for example, in the smooth muscle of the GI tract. 
and you get instead a depolarization. You notice it's still a G-protein coupled receptor, but you get the closing of potassium channels. So you see, again, the meaning of the message depends on the ligand and the receptor type. So let's look at epinephrine and norepinephrine next. These are catecholamines, and there are five different receptors that these guys can bind to, and you'll notice that they vary uh, depending upon where they are in the body, they vary in structure, and they also vary in sensitivity. So this column of sensitivity just means that, for example, the alpha-1s are more sensitive to norepinephrine than they are to epinephrine. For beta-1s, it's the same, right? I just included that because some of you will have to know um, the different sensitivities of these guys. Okay, but what happens when epinephrine or norepinephrine actually binds to these receptors? So when they bind to an alpha-1, what you get is an activation of phospholipase C, and you get the production of the second messenger IP3, or inositol triphosphate. This you'll see in a lot of signaling cascades, um, and the increase in cytoplasmic calcium levels will also cause muscle contraction, things like that. If epinephrine or norepinephrine bind to alpha-2 receptors, you see a decrease in the second messenger cyclic AMP. And when epinephrine or norepinephrine binds to any of the beta receptors, you see an increase in cyclic AMP. So let's put it all together and go back to our little schematic of motor pathways. So somatic motor neurons release a neurotransmitter onto receptors on skeletal muscle, and the effect is always excitatory because the signal is always for contraction of skeletal muscle. Now you might think that we could just take an autonomic motor neuron and do exactly the same thing. Unfortunately, no. The reason why the ANS can be such a pain is because it appears that it takes two neurons to do the job of one. You have neuron number one releasing a neurotransmitter, not on a target, but on receptors that are far away from the target in what we call ganglia. In the ganglion, there's a neuron number two, which comes out and will release a neurotransmitter onto the final target. So in other words, you have two neurons in the autonomic motor division, while in the somatic motor, you have only one. That's confusing. We call these neurons, not neurons number one and two, but a preganglionic neuron and a postganglionic neuron. Hopefully that makes sense, right? Now these ganglia, the location of them depends on which of the two divisions you are looking at. So sympathetic ganglia, generally run right along the spinal cord, just parallel to the spinal cord. Most parasympathetic ganglia are out closer to the effectors. So the secret formula of the autonomic motor division is this. You gotta know which neurocrine is released by the preganglionic neuron onto which receptor on the ganglion. Then you have which neurocrine of the postganglionic neuron and which receptor on the target. And when you know the combination of these four things, you, you got it, right? These are the only neurocrines we have and these are the only receptor types you have to choose from. And that will be it. Let's look at the parasympathetic division. The preganglionic neuron in the parasympathetic division is always cholinergic, which means it releases acetylcholine. The receptors on the ganglion are always nicotinic. So that means this signal is always excitatory. All right, well, what about the postganglionic neuron? Oh my gosh, it's also cholinergic. That's cool. So it also releases acetylcholine. Now, the receptor type on the target cells, these are different. These are muscarinic receptors. So depending upon which type, remember there were five subtypes of those, you'll get either an excitatory or an inhibitory response. So for example, in the heart, it would be inhibitory, but in smooth muscle of the gut, it would be excitatory. And that, ladies and gentlemen, is the parasympathetic motor pathway. The sympathetic motor pathway, the preganglionic neuron, is also cholinergic. So do you see they're both cholinergic, they release acetylcholine, 
the receptors are the same. They're nicotinic as well. So the only difference between the two in this view is this postganglionic neuron. In the sympathetic division, it's adrenergic, and it releases the neurotransmitter norepinephrine. And the targets are going to be those adrenergic receptors, either the alpha or the beta. So again, the effect on the target will depend on which of the adrenergic receptors you've got. So here we are comparing the two. And by the way, I have drawn the lengths to be anatomically representative. So the parasympathetic division, that preganglionic neuron is long and the postganglionic neuron is short. The opposite is true in the sympathetic division, right? So that relates to where the ganglia actually are. Now, just for comparison, I'm throwing in the somatic motor division here. So you see the difference between the somatic motor where you have only one motor neuron and the autonomic motor neurons where you have two. Now, we're almost done. There's one more kind of weird one, and that's called the adrenal sympathetic pathway. So we have still a preganglionic neuron that is cholinergic, so it releases acetylcholine onto nicotinic receptors. But this isn't a ganglion. This is the adrenal medulla. So the adrenal gland is very strange because the cortex is actually a gland, but the medulla, the inner part, is actually modified nervous tissue. So it acts like a postganglionic neuron in a way, but it's not a neuron. So it's very strange, but it releases epinephrine and norepinephrine. It's actually, I think, 80% epinephrine, 20% norepinephrine looks like it may be releasing some dopamine as well, which is kind of exciting, but it releases those neurocrines. You see now why we call them neurocrines? Because they act like hormones. They're released into the blood, and they will bind to adrenergic receptors on targets all over the body. So that is a little bit strange. There is no postganglionic neuron in the adrenal sympathetic pathway. So now we compare all pathways together, somatic motor, parasympathetic, sympathetic, and the adrenal sympathetic. And ladies and gentlemen, I'm excited to tell you that that is it. Those are all the possible combinations. So if you can understand these pathways, you got it, Penguin Prof style. As always, I hope that was helpful. Thank you so much for visiting the Penguin Prof channel. Please show your support by clicking those buttons. Like, share, and subscribe. Join me on Facebook. Follow on Twitter. Good luck.